Hi, everybody. This is Gina Cavalier at the Liberated Healer Podcast. Today, we have Susan Anderson, who is a very dear person that helped me through a grieving process that she probably doesn't know that she's aware of right now. But I'm so glad to have her here and to talk about her knowledge about grieving, her books, and everything that she knows that can help us a little bit to get through the other side of grief. Welcome, Susan. Oh, it's, I'm happy to be here, Gina. Oh, gosh. And if I cry, I'm in the middle of a release. I'm in the stage of rage and lifting a little bit. So please go ahead and let's tell people a little bit about yourself, and then we'll get into a little bit of the content of what you teach and how you help people. Yes. Okay. Well, I'm the founder of Abandonment Recovery, which is, you know, a series of insights and tools that help you overcome going through a breakup or grief or abandonment trauma from childhood or adulthood. And the abandonment wound is the basis of why we feel insecure. It's at the root of what makes heartache hurt so much. It's what makes going through a divorce so painful. It's what makes through going through grief so difficult. It is the source of self-sabotage when we do these self-defeating things that sort of abandon ourselves. So it is it is the underlying primal wound of abandonment that we need to heal from, and that's what the program is all about. And we definitely, you know, do need to heal from them. Also, you talk about grief when a loved one is passed. I mean, anything grief-related, you know, I was guided to you. I don't know if this is esoteric. I was guided to you by my guide, who I never heard of you, honestly. And I, I was going through a, a very sudden grief stricken position in my life and I was overwhelmed and just in terrible pain and I just got your name written down in my ear and I and I was led to it and what I was led to this and I think this might resonate with people when I can intellectualize what's going on with me I can get through it a little better and that's why the audiobooks that you have just caught absolutely was like the best friend I needed through this whole journey because I could just regulate my body and see where am I right now you know what I'm having a panic attack it's coming up go ahead and go back to the first chapter or the second chapter and then I within 15 minutes or something I was understanding that uh, this wasn't just me go, like a process I this pain that there this is common everybody goes through this and that kind of helped like go oh this is a, a phase i'm in so can you talk about the the swirl stages because i i think that's really important yeah when you go through grief and loss there's a universal process that we all go through and it's it has the acronym swirl it stands for shattering withdrawal internalizing rage and lifting those are the names of the stages but in shattering that's when we realize that the rug has been pulled out from underneath. It could be a death or a rejection and an abandonment. It could be a date that we thought was going well, but the person didn't call back. It can be a feeling that we thought we had security, but then it's been pulled away from us. And so we feel shattered. And in the shattering, there's, it's very natural for the, a lot of panic. And like a regression to feeling symbiotic as if we can't live without the, the object. We, we, we just are falling apart because we're missing that person. Uh, we can go through this even if it's a job. We could lose a job and have a similar experience. These, these stages are very universal to a number of different experiences. After the shattering phase, you sort of overlap into the next phase you start to miss that, that person. You yearn for them. You long for them. And they, they're not there. So you feel this awful feeling of desperation where you need something and want something, but you can't get it. You are in withdrawal as if they were a drug. Oh, a, a band, a, um, relationships are addictive. So they're positive addictions because that's what creates attachments between mammals and humans. <clears throat> but they're when you are needing and yearning for the other half of the attachment and they're not there, the object is missing. You feel as if you need a fix and you can't get it. 
And the symptoms of withdrawal are very similar. In fact, they're actually the same as you go through with heroin withdrawal. You have flu-like symptoms. You, you're very uncomfortable. You can't sleep. You're on edge. Um, so the withdrawal stage is when you're in withdrawal, you're really, really jonesing for that that object and you can't get it. And there's the most helpless, despairing feeling. So that, that, that was definitely the hardest phase with the withdrawal. And that's why I really appreciated the audio because I listened. That was my one that I listened to over and over again because it felt like that. It was energy running through my body and it was outside of me. And I, I, and, you know, I had to go to work or I had to you know, move on with my life with things. How do you do that? So we need these tools um, and to understand this is um, also, is it, is it your mind that's making these things or is it your body that's making these things? And of course, it's both. Okay. Um, but, you know, it's when you go through this process, this swirl process. Um, it makes you feel as if you, you're, you, you're weak, you've gone crazy, you're, there's something wrong with you. You feel ashamed of being this upset. You know, men and women go through this and men are supposed to be more emotionally um, stoic than women, which isn't true. But, you know, there's sort of this cultural thing that men are supposed to handle this. And when they go through this, they can't go crying to 10 different friends the way women can. because there's such a stigma, but men and women really feel that there's something wrong with them. They're weak. Why can't I handle it? And that's why the information about the, what you're going through biophysiologically, as well as emotionally, it, it gives the mind, the brain, you know, the adult part of, of who we are, it gives that an ability to understand and, and accept what you're going through. The next phase is internalizing, and this is very painful going through internalizing because you are, and you overlap into, you're going through all the stages at the same time. You know, you're sort of cycling through them. Yeah. Um, and in internalizing, you're blaming yourself. I'm not, I'm not enough. This must be because I'm not special. I, I just have bad luck. I wasn't meant to have. A, a, a permanent relationship. There's something wrong with me. I'm not lovable. I'm not acceptable. We make all of these assumptions about ourselves based on the loss because it can't just be random. It has to be an indication of that thing that we've been afraid of since we were infants, which is we're, we're just not enough. If, if I cry, mommy won't come to the crib. You know, it's that primal feeling we that we all have because we all experience times in childhood when we were just scared and alone and we couldn't find you know someone to give us comfort it's the feeling of i'm just not enough i'm too i'm too weak i'm i'm not good enough so the internalizing is when we take the the awful loss out on ourselves and beat ourselves up and make all kinds of negative assumptions and this is when it affects our self-esteem because we are really doubting our self-worth during this time. And then the next stage is very difficult too. It's the rage stage. And, um, you know, the idea people like to say that, well, um, when you're angry, that's good because you're turning the feelings outward. And in a sense, that's true. But when you're going through the rage stage of loss and grief and abandonment, you're not happy. You're still in a crisis because you feel agitated. You're, it's not a, a powerful rage yeah. where you're like, you know, standing up like Godzilla, ready to take on the world. It's, a, it's an agitated, frustrated, pained rage of not being able to, to click your fingers and have the life that you want. It's the rage of frustration, of, of deprivation. So it's a, an extremely uncomfortable feeling. So people who are in the rage stage, and again, you're cycling through all of the stages. Um, people in the rage stage are, are very prone to feeling frustrated with their friends and, and 
even therapists who, who say things like, just let go and move forward, or you're still pining like that, or maybe you need medication, or, you know, they oh, get yeah. angry because people say things that show that nobody can really understand the fact that you're fighting a big monster and you're doing a good job of it, but it's very difficult. So people say things that are simplistic, advice that you simply can't apply. And the okay. rage sometimes comes out at our friends and, you know, family members because they don't understand what we're going through. And then the, the fifth stage, lifting, is very significant and very interesting because it sounds so nice. You lift out of the abandonment, but it sounds just, oh, you know, like you're, it's over, but it isn't because you keep cycling through these over and over until you finally do feel better. But the lifting means that here are all of these powerful feelings of self-doubt and rage and hurt and missing and withdrawal and longing, all of these feelings so intense, these panic and the shattering, all of it's so intense. And you you begin to notice that you you get distracted by a beautiful bouquet of daffodils or a sunset happens or a robin lands on your on a tree branch and you think you feel momentarily distracted. So that's lifting. Lifting is when life begins to pull you back. But there's a, a, a very big caveat. When you begin to lift out of the abandonment, it's important to take all of those feelings with you, to be in touch with all of those feelings, all of, all of the, the vulnerability that you felt and all of the fear. It's part of you and to take it with you and remember it, and nurture it and cherish it. Because if you leave the feelings behind, which a lot of people do, yeah. they just say, I'm done with this. And that off they go to date somebody else or drink a lot or whatever it's going to be. But if you leave the feelings behind, you can lose touch with your feelings. You can become detached and remote, like someone with a little too much scar tissue where you're numb. And if that happens, patterns set in. And one of the most common patterns is being attracted only to the unavailable. Because when you're attracted to the unavailable, you feel insecure and you feel on the, on the verge of abandonment. You feel less than, you feel all these feelings and at least you can feel something. So when you leave your feelings behind and you have this numb area, what people do is they get into these patterns that cause them to sort of like feel something even if it's negative, because they need to feel. The need to feel is tremendous. Yeah. Just like when, um, when you hear stories of people who've been um, traumatized in childhood, it's pretty common, um, you know, sexual abuse in childhood and ter terrible experiences of pain and humiliation and shame. But sometimes when people get to become teenagers or young adults, they take on lovers who are older and who are abusive and who bad relationships, why would they repeat the same thing over again? Why would they take on someone who's going to make them feel the awful feelings that they had in childhood? Why? Because mm -hmm. it's what they can feel. Mm -hmm. So that's, it allows them to feel even if the feelings are negative. So it's very similar to people who come out of abandonment, even in high school or you know, it could be an earlier abandonment and they wind up becoming attracted to the unavailable and constantly chasing love without being able to receive the security. So the mm -hmm. five stages that spell swirl, it's cyclical. And the important thing is to know how to handle the feeling so that if you know how to handle them and keep them with you and cherish them and nurture them, they're always a part of you. All of those feelings, they're normal. But if you know how to handle them, you won't develop all those self-defeating patterns. Wow. And in my experience, so swirl one, you know, was longer, many weeks each age. And then I would, like you said, go back and forth, right? But each time it was almost like it got shorter amount of time, shorter amount of time, shorter amount of time. 
till it was really, um, you know, sometimes in a day that you go through them, right? Yes. Oh, yeah. You, you spin through them after a while. And, and you did yourself a big favor, though, because you used the information from the, the tape, from the book, to inform your mind, your adult mind, the part of you in charge. You know, there's big you and little you. The inner child is a very important part of you. But guess who's in charge? Guess who loves inner, the inner child and who gives nurturance to the inner child? It's the adult self. So you gave your adult self the information that it needed to be able to get through those phases without feeling crazy or weak. Yes. And that's why it's so important. And I was the, the child that you described is exactly me, you know, coming from an abusive household and then calling it being love challenge and calling it, um, you know, my dad was married, I think, 11 times. My mom was married five times. I came from a household of people that just were like love bombing each other and then just burning it down. And I just longed for family and a, lo a long-term family-like relationship. But the good people, I would just go, I, I think I would just say, oh, that's not no enough. interest. No interest. Why don't we get the person that does all these things? And so I was very love challenged. Um, but that's why I love this show and what people like you and when we get into these positions where we can take control. And that's why this, your series is so important because there, I don't think there's a person in the world that doesn't have this, have this kinds of experience in their life. Not one. Not one. So we're, we're no different, right? But if you can intellectualize like what's happening and then I could, I was talking outside of myself while I was. Um, soul presencing, I would call it, or however you did with your inner child. You explained how to do that. That was so helpful to me. And I, you know, I just, as a child, held myself and I gave myself that forgiveness that this is all okay, you know. And, and like I said, knowing that, oh, I'm in this phase, I can get out of this phase really did give me so much strength. I mean, this only happened to me about six months ago. And I feel amazing. I mean, I'm building great relationships. My business is doing well. Um, I, uh, I, I barely even think about it anymore. And when it does come up, I just let it go in a calm way with love and compassion. And this is the first time, and I've had these things obviously help happen a big chunk of my life uh, on and off, right? This is the first time I've been in such control. And that's why I reached out to you because that this audio tape, like I feel like was my best friend through this whole situation. I feel like everybody that's going through something like that, we need these companions because the only person that can be with us 24 seven is ourself. And we have, even if we have a good support system, we can't rely on other, you know, we can't just be this constant, like I need to talk it out. You know, you need tools. Yeah. We need to take the other person out of the loop as the like we need to take our friends off the hook and our lovers off the hook and we need to learn how to give ourselves approval or ourselves reassurance and ourselves support and ourselves some some you know some tender loving care when we know how to do that we can take the other people out of the loop and we can still need them we always will need connection and we'll be so connected and receiving all of these things from other people. But if we can give that to ourselves, then the other person is not overburdened with it. It's not, we're not over relying on anyone else. It gives us a lot of freedom. But you know what you're saying about um, the, the fact that you went and got through this process pretty rapidly. It's normal for it to take a long time, of course. Um, but you, obviously, it helped you really process your way through it. But, you know, that, that just reminds me how important it is to strengthen the adult self, the, you know, your cognitive mind, to equip your mind with tools and with information that can really help. Because you, as your adult self, your primary responsibility is to take care of little you, of your inner child, of your emotions. And when you said um, that, you think that everyone just about has this. They all do because everyone was born 
And so everyone experienced what it was like when they were in a womb and everything was perfect. They had homeostasis. Everything was delicious and perfect. And then all of a the sudden they're born and they're in this cold room and it's there, it, all these people and these lights. And they're too little, of course, to have any judgment about it. They're just experiencing it. But there's a part of the brain that's already developed. It's the amygdala. And the amygdala can record those sensations of being, ah, what? Uh, you know, the amygdala can record that disconnection, th those feelings of suddenly you're cold and you're, you're alone. And I mean, you don't have words for it when you're first born. But then, then, then someone picks you up after you've been born and now, oh, it feels good again. And then that person puts you down on a cold surface again. Oh, you feel miserable again. Then again, you're picked up and somebody feeds you. Oh, and it feels so good to not be starving hungry. And then they put you down again. So when everyone goes through the sequence of connection, disconnection, connection, disconnection, because there's no other solution. In some cultures, infants are placed on your back or even on your front. So the child isn't going through quite as much of the being connected and disconnected, but there's still, no matter how perfect the system is, a child experiences birth and then separation, disconnection, and then connection and disconnection and connection. So we all have a tendon, we all have an amygdala that's developed to feel anxious when there's disconnection and, and good when there's connection. So we all develop a fear of disconnection and of, and of, and a wanting loving connection, wanting that. It's just part of being a mammal. It's part of being human too. It's part of who we are, and we're all, we are all vulnerable to grief and abandonment and rejection, every single human being. Some of us have um, much more um, positive experiences in childhood, or we have uh, other, some, some way that makes us not have a strong reaction, and um, it's very rare to meet someone who's not all that vulnerable to abandonment but some people may be less vulnerable than others, but we all have it. And I love that you mentioned about, um, in general, the male biology is not to be uh, expressing this as much. What that turns into, but that's not addressed, you know, that can start a war basically in my mind, you know, uh, if a man doesn't know how or have the opportunity and there's such a thing as abandonment rage and men and women can feel abandonment rage. Um, I mean, powerful rage where you have imagery of wanting to take your, the person's head and crap, you know, how could you do this to me? Abandonment rage. It's so normal. It is because the pain is so great, but I'm not saying men are more prone to right. act out violently than women, but they have the, the strength the upper body strength to act it out if they want, want to, but men and women have this abandonment rage. And you hear stories about um, people who are going through abandonment, killing the, their rival or killing the person who abandoned them. You, it's a very common cause of, you know, for murder in yeah. our society. And it's, this is where that feeling comes from. But yeah. where I have like, uh, you know, a lot of empathy for men in this situation is that the socialization process for men is to, you can, a man can have a couple of really close buddies, but after you've been going through this for like four months and you're still wanting to talk people's ears off and whine and complain and go ruminate and go over why did why did they leave me? What did I do wrong? Why, how could this be? And after four or five months, and people go through this for a long time, it, it's very normal. But men don't have as many friends who are willing to hang in for four or five months. Whereas and, women tend to, yeah. Yeah, we can press your hand a little bit more. 
And that yeah. it's just so helpful because it's not, you have a book, but you also have the audio book is so easy. You know, um, you start getting like, I need to talk to somebody. I'm having, I'm having, an, I'm feeling some rage or I'm feeling lost. or I'm feeling, You just pop in that audio, go to the chapter that speaks to you. And it does start to calm everything down. And now you're starting to intellectualize what, oh, I'm just in this stage. It's not me as a person. This happens to everyone. That's how I was yeah. feeling. And I was like, oh, okay. So I just have to get to the stage actually. And it made me giggle a little bit. Like I'm almost there. You know, it made me see you in yourself. Yes. Yeah. It, yeah. You know, um, and um, you have a, I haven't downloaded it yet, but I'm looking at it to do it soon. Is the abandoned holism. Uh, yes. yes. Okay. Can you tell us a little bit about oh, that? Yes. That's such a big one. Um, the world is filled with a band I mean, there are millions and millions of people who are beautiful, eligible, wonderful, loving people, but they can't seem to be in a long-term relationship because they're too a band which means that they're only attracted to the unavailable. So if they're, if they're not feeling that they, that there's a chance that they could be abandoned, then they're not interested. Mm. So when you're only attracted to someone who's not available, then that leaves you alone because you're always looking for love and not finding it. And the flip side of only being attracted to the unavailable is losing interest, as you mentioned it before, when the person is available. You know, the, the family background that you had, all that trauma, all that trauma. And then when someone's like from a normal family, it's like, what's who you know who needs that it's it doesn't even compute so when a person is a bandaholic and it's so common there are so many millions of people in this situation and the person that they're pursuing suddenly becomes available at first you're happy and then you start noticing things like they have a grammar that they get wrong and then you start noticing that they when they put their coat on the back of the chair it's all wrinkled and then you start noticing that they have they have something in their tooth <laughs> and then you know you begin turning off you begin losing the attraction and you you know what am i doing why am i i'm losing interest what's wrong with me why why can't i i be in love I, there's even a song why can't i fall in love like any other man what kind of fool am i it's an old song and, you know, that why, why can't I be in love? I, I thought I wanted this person. What's wrong with me? And the answer is, well, they're too available. And now yeah. he's like, you like, yourself one of them. It's like, you, it's like you, you almost work your way out of them all. And all of a sudden, um, I've had this happen to me and I've done it myself where it was, yeah, it's like, you know, everything's going good. You've had the love. Uh, it's a great compatibility. Um, there's a lot to, there would be a lot to grow together, but if you aren't really working on this stuff, like through books or, 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 uh, an awareness that I need to work on this, like, but I, I feel like when you have that awareness, that's the number one thing, like, cause you can talk to yourself and say, wait, wait, wait. And I think that's what you're getting to, but I just, all of a sudden, like everything they do is wrong and they can't win. And then they don't know what's happening and they can feel the shift happening with you. And then all well, of a sudden. Yeah, I mean, so many people are at one end or the other. They're either at the giving end of this torture by falling out of love with who they're with. And they, they start finding fault and they, they lose all the, and there's no sexual energy. There's no attraction mm -hmm. left. They just, you know, they just don't feel it anymore. And they're, so they're at the, they're giving the, the grief to somebody else, or you could wind up being the one who is being treated that way. And either way, it is not a pleasant situation. Um, that a very common pattern is that um, I hear this all the time. Somebody will be single, and it'll for they'll, they're feeling that they'll never find someone. The same thing keeps happening over and over. Um, they're, they're already, you know, 40 or 50 and they, they can't find a relationship and they're, 
so pessimistic. And then they finally meet somebody. And this time, let's say it's a woman who meets a man, just to be very conventional. Okay. So it's a woman who meets a man. And finally, she meets a man who's not a narcissist. He is not self-centered. It's all about her. You know, he, he cares about her guppies. Do they have enough food? And the next time he comes, he brings guppy food for her. Oh, it's all about her and her guppies. And, and her, he, he, he sweeps the, the porch because there were some pine cones there. And he's so helpful. It's all about her finally. But then once he catches her and she says, okay, I'm, I'm into it. I'm into you now. We're, you know, we can, yeah, I'm with you. Well, that's when he starts to pull away because he's an abandoholic and he needed, he was very interested when he was catching her, when he was pursuing her. He brought food for her guppies and he swept her porch and very nice. But when he actually has her, he goes through the same thing. He loses interest. And I have, I don't know, thousands of people have written to me and talked to me in workshops and so forth, um, telling me that the, the pain it is to, to finally trust someone and the same thing happens. As soon as you finally get together, they start to pull away. Yeah. And of course, you know, when this happens, it goes through the swirl. You feel shattered. Then you're yearning for that person. Oh, come on, please call, call me back. Yeah, let's get together. Oh, please. And then you're blaming, I'm not enough. I, I, I screwed it up. I'm, I'm, I'm not beautiful enough or I'm not successful enough or whatever. You blame it on yourself. And then, oh, this is so frustrating and the rage. And then let me just get distracted. I'll have a couple of drinks. I'll lift out of this with, and I'll, I'll get away from the situation. I don't, I don't want to feel my feelings anymore. Yep. And so this is the such a common pattern out there. Yeah, absolutely. And then they numb it and then they meet someone that's okay. Yes. Yeah. You know, we just have to dive in and do this self work and hopefully we find the other person that's kind of equally on that same um path. Yeah. No, you can give them your audio book. <laughs> yes. You go and learn about this. Um and I also think um as we as the times are changing and adding the social media factors and things like that, and which technology has been great for so many things. Um, but you know, social media adds another stressor because you see people having, um, relationships, like little pictures on Instagram and like, Oh, is he dating someone else? Like, I, I'm just saying like, there are so many ways that we can batter ourselves and get in our head and take us out of our life. path, And that's, you know, and super suffering there. Well, um, social media has taken what was already a very painful situation for many people and has turned it into real torment. Yes. Because yes. you know the kind of life that you want. Yes. That's bad enough because you're not quite having the life that you want. It's not the life that you dreamt of having. It's not the life that you want so badly that you can see yourself having, but that you just haven't gotten there yet. It's not bad enough that you have to go through that, but you have to see other people having that life. And yep. then you also have to go through watching yourself be excluded from parties and gatherings. And you watch your ex being involved with another woman. And you had told yourself, I'm making this very conventional with a woman to man, yep. just because we're both women and yeah. Um, but you know, you watch your ex, um, you had convinced yourself that it was because he was commitment phobic and there's something wrong with him that he can't commit. And then you say, well, how come he's, how come they're getting engaged then? He was able to commit to her, but not me. It hurts very, very deeply. Yeah. So being sort of able to be a voyeur of other people's lives, thanks to all these social, you know, platforms, um, takes what already was a very, very difficult situation, you know, going into the world and coming, coming through the process of being in a relationship, you know, 
what what makes it 10 times harder is the social media. Yeah. And then, you know, say if there's a breakup, then all the friends block you, the whole family blocks you. So all of a sudden, it's not just that one-on-one relationship grief that you're grieving. You're grieving the entire experience with these people. And, and they're, they're, you know, you think about memories with each one of those people. And now it feels just, I mean, it just kind of adds on to all the other pain that you're going through. Oh, it, it, it's unbelievable. It just you know, adds so much complication. And it's, and, and people could be mean, people could say awful things, you know, so I just wanted to bring that up because it's just another reason why we have to take control of our own emotions and life. And when we are grieving, we have to really just find ways and tools like your, your tools to, to just support ourselves. And of course, our friend, we can, we can add to that, right? But we have to have a strong base. You know, a strong base is something that's long overdue for most people anyway. So all of these things, as terrible as they are, um, are a challenge to, to really develop the ability to stand on your own two feet, to take responsibility for yourself. And that's one of those easier said than done platitudes, you know, um, stand on your own two feet. How do you do that? Well, the the answer to that really is having a new relationship with yourself big you to little you it's taking the self and dividing it into two one half of it is big you your your cerebral cortex self your adult self your thinking brain the brain that went to school and learned a lot of things and the brain that's listening to the to the uh, audio book or you know, the, that's the adult self. That So you divide yourself in half. One half is that. And the other half is your emotional self, part that feels and has fears and wants and sad, is, can be scared. The part that has excitement and anticipation and dreams and hopes, that's the emotional part, the part that has all of those feelings. So there's they're divided into two, the adult self and then the emotional self, big you and little you. And once you have that division, you have to do it using your imagination. You sort of create it. Once you create it, you then take care of yourself. So when people say, stand on your own two feet, you need to have a foundation because like in the social media world, it's so easy to get hurt. You could have people bullying you online and so forth. How do you how do you cope with that? You must have stand on your own two feet, but how? Well, how is to develop a stronger relationship with yourself so that when little you says, oh, that hurts, I'm lonely and I'm scared and it hurts when people are mean to me, or, then big you is there with a good relationship with little who can say, I, I'm with you. I'm not letting anything bad happen to you. I will never abandon you. I'm here for you. So that relationship becomes sort of a new self that really can be self-sufficient, emotionally self-reliant. So I, I use that a lot. And I, uh, I was in the car a lot because I was driving from Montana to California back and forth throughout my uh, breakup and whatever happened. But um, so I was in the car a lot. So I would do this whole st- Thing that you I, what do you call that uh big you little you yeah I mean, yeah I call it I call it the big little dialogue you just I mean and I just cried for hours and then I just felt like so loved by myself and that that transformed into self-love and I feel like I have more self-love than I ever had before I met before this experience so I'm I'm ending with self-love by that present scene because I was constantly telling myself you're okay, you're going to get through this. And I was like imagining holding myself as a child and letting go of the old wounds. Um, and they're still there, but I'm filling them with self-love. And that, that's what gave, so made me started to feel like, oh, I can do this and get my strength back. It takes instruction from people like yourself, but then it takes practice. What you're saying is so important. Um, Yes, it, it does take practice. Um, but the, the fact that the 
adult self can be so loving and caring to the to the inner child and that you can feel that is that's worth going through the experience um not everyone has an easy time at first making that connection um the fact that you were able to make that connection it's wonderful it's really fantastic that you could do that as quickly as you did um not everyone has such an easy time because they they go through the exercise they follow what the book tells them to do and they or they come to a workshop and I guide them through it and they're just not able to feel it yeah um so that's it 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 still works and it just doesn't feel as good but what the part of it that works is the recognition that you really do have two parts you actually have three parts you have big you little you your emotional self and then you have the outer child that interferes but just recognizing that you that you have the capacity to love yourself even if it's only intellectual even if you can't feel it you felt it and most people can but not everyone and there's nothing wrong if you can't feel it you know, it's it's perfectly normal to to go through the exercise and you just don't oh, feel it, but you understand it. Yeah, and that is a that's a very important part of it. Understanding yes. what self love looks like, what kind of a relationship you need to have inside. So you might not develop the relationship the same way somebody like you would develop it who feels it, but you begin to put it together with your mind your your grown up self your adult self begins to create that relationship it, it's life changing it is and i also saw other relationships get better during this process because um it opened me and you know, the people that knew that i was going through a hard time you know there were some people that kind of fell off and that were like oh you've been through this before i don't want to go through this with you again but then there was a few people that really stood out and we healed our relationship through this experience. Um, and we, we loved each other and supported each other. And I do believe it's because I was able to, um, almost like work the program, you know what I mean? So, um, it, it actually lent to healing other relationships. It was, so at the end, like you said, I, I feel like I've healed, I, I, you know, I had a loss. And then I did the work. And at the end, I came out with more self-love, better relationships with the people that I, I needed to heal with. And then now I feel kind of brand new and like the world is open. And now I can go through the abandoholic uh, program with you. <laughs> can yeah. maybe, that's my goal. And that, but I just feel like a lot of people have similar story as me. Is why I'm oh, yes. Here. But now I can go with awareness. Say, I do that. <laughs> yes. And then maybe I can coach that person. I don't know what's going to happen. The whole world is open. But maybe if I start to recognize like the, the things going on, if I meet someone and go, oh, maybe you need to go to, a you want to hear this audio taking part? Because right. you can start to recognize in other people and maybe they're just not, they've been blind to it for such a long time. And that's how we grow together as a tribe. Yes. Maybe. Yeah. That's, Thank you. That's great. <laughs> That's very well put. Because yes, when you when you finally catch on to what's going on internally and you learn that you can actually do something about it with love for yourself and you discover this, yes, the idea is to share it with other people because it doesn't necessarily happen spontaneously. The way the world is designed, we don't necessarily realize this without somebody helping us find the path. Yeah. And you actually have a, you, well, for me, I was very proud of myself because I could have gone down a dark road. I could have had drunken nights. I could have, um, you know, done other, hung out with, meet other people randomly that didn't fill me. You know what I mean? To fill that hole. But, and I, there's no shame in doing that either, but I'm just saying that, you know, also, um, there's a, the, there's something where you get like a pat on your own back when you're like, yes, you, you know, whether you did or didn't, but there's a, that thing. I don't know. I just, 
you know, I had found a way to say, you did this, you're okay. Like, you know, and I really, you appreciate you guided me through that. And I feel very connected to you in your work. And, um, I know that you have a, um, you have a retreat in Boone, North Carolina, correct? And yes. uh, middle of May called Overcoming Self-Sabotage. Yes. And that sounds very, very interesting. Yeah. Uh, I've got one coming up uh, in two weeks, too. Yeah. In, in Massachusetts, in Lenox, Massachusetts, in the Berkshires, a three-day oh, nice. weekend. And then one coming up in Boone, in Boone, North Carolina, which is the most gorgeous place. Well, they're both beautiful. Yeah. Um, but Boone is just a beautiful area. It's way up there looking down on mountain ranges. Oh, wow. Yes. And that workshop is, is very powerful. And just to recap, this isn't because we talked a lot about uh, my personal experience and it was a relationship, but this applies to uh, uh, losing a, a, a family member or partner, death. Um, even a death of an animal or a pet, or uh, if you are not finding the right relationship, you don't have to have like the big heartbreak if you're like recognizing, right, these patterns. So this is also, I mean, this applies to many. Yeah, relationships. because you're in, if you're struggling to find a relationship and you're feeling isolated, it's it's a lot of abandonment stuff. People who are struggling to find a relationship, they, if if you throw the word abandonment around, they'll say, oh, yeah. I've got a lot of that, you know, because they're feeling as if they've they've been somehow abandoned by life or they've missed the boat or it's their own fault. And look what I've done to myself. You know, all of this internalizing and blaming themselves, which is all part of that abandonment syndrome. Yes. And I'm glad that you had named it sort of what, something that we can really recognize. It might be the next, you know, program that people really need to go on. Yes. Uh, you know, because like you said. The whole world has a little bit of it, especially yes. if, and that's the way it's been designed right now. So, yes, you know, so thank you so much, Susan. Is there anything else you would like to uh, leave us with today? Well, you know, I think the point that I, I always try to emphasize with anyone entering into a recovery, being in recovery from the abandonment wound, from primal abandonment, being in recovery, it's an ongoing process. But I always try to emphasize the fact that you don't achieve this kind of stuff perfectly. And you do it sort of at your own time in your own pace. And for instance, let's say that, well, the example I, I always use is codependency, being a people pleaser. Let's say that you're a people pleaser and you are trying to stop being a people pleaser. That's all part of abandonment, you know, needing people to like you and being afraid to assert yourself because you're afraid of being abandoned, all that. That's all part of abandonment. And you're a people pleaser, but you don't have to stop being a people pleaser in order to do better. You just have to improve it a tiny bit. You can still be a people pleaser and Thanks. just a little less. Yep. So, you know, what I always try to emphasize is you don't have to fix something perfectly. You don't have to be perfect. You could just kind of move in a better direction and improve a little bit. And sometimes that little bit is all it takes. It's just it, just enough to get you where you need to be. Oh, I appreciate you so much in the work you do. And I'm going to link everything um, below so you can find her books and everything. Oh, thank you. you. Anderson. And um, thank you so much, Susan, for your time today. Thank you for having me, Gina. It was my pleasure. Uh, this has been the Gina, uh, the Liberated Healer podcast. Thank you so much. Bye for now.